beautiful people. Just getting my notes out. So we'll be picking up a part two. Sorry I had to leave you guys at the last one, but I'm back. So we're gonna talk. We're gonna get back on this this whole this whole concept of of the strength of black families, where we were in the 70s, where are we at right now? Where do we need to be moving to? Where do we need to be going with this? So we're gonna be having that conversation. Y'all make sure you guys have your pens and papers because you know when I'm in my teaching mood, I give you guys some things that y'all can look up on your own. You don't have to take my word. I don't, I don't want anybody just to take my word and just go through it, right? I'm not, I'm not a pastor. I'm not gonna sit up there and just give people what my interpretation is and then tell people that my way is the right way because there ain't no such thing. Is what we have to be able to get to together that can make us all, not one of us, not some of us, but make us all successful and get us back to our rightful power, our rightful position and our rightful throne. What I'm doing is I'm going over a book review article. The article was published by Columbia University's Teachers College and it talked about um, a book that was written by Dr. Robert Hill. The book was titled The Strengths of Black Families. And in Dr. Hill's book, he identified at this time when he wrote the book in 1972, he identified five strengths in the black family. But what he says is no one really takes the time to look at the strengths of a black family. And if we understand the strengths, then we'll know what the weaknesses are. And once we know what the weaknesses are, then we can go out there and start coming up with programs and agendas to help black people to do better in their communities. Understood? So some of the strengths that he went over, the last video I did, I identified two of the strengths, if I'm not mistaken. So the first strength I identified was strong kinship bonds. The second strength that he identified was strong work orientation. So people having strong work ethics, despite the fact that many people like to assume that, you know, we, we, we're lazy people. What he's saying is that's not what he finds in his research. We, we actually do have a strong work ethic. And what I did in the first video was to compare that to my upbringing and how my mother instilled a strong work ethic in me and my brother. And even though we grew up poor, she made sure that we had strong work ethics. The third strength of the black family that he saw was adaptability of family roles. Adaptability of family roles. And what Dr. Robert Hill was saying was what he sees when it comes to not only black families, but white families too, but we're focusing on a black family unit. What he sees is, is more of an egalitarian structure. So basically what he's saying is there is no, how do you say it? There's no, you're the woman, you stay home, cook, clean, and take care of the children. I'm the man, I'm gonna go out and work. Not that this thing, these things don't exist in some of our families, but what he's saying is, is adaptability. We're able to say, listen, I may be the man, but I, I'm going to also help raise the children. I'm also going to participate in their extracurricular activities. I'm also going to cook dinner when, when my wife is not home or when a mother of my children is not home. I'm also going to provide the dinner. And the woman is going to say, yeah, you're the man and you work, but I'm also going to go out to work so we can make sure that we're all collectively paying these bills so we won't lose our house. We won't lose our cars. The children can have what they need in life and have a better, more quality life. So what he's saying is the roles, he sees the strength of the black family unit is that we don't get so boggled down on you're the man, you're supposed to do this. You're the woman, you're supposed to do this. This is what he was writing in 1972. I would have to say that a lot of that still exists to this day. And that is a strength that we have as a people. And that is a strength that we cannot ignore. And I see that we sometimes we are, um, we, we allow other people's beliefs and other people's narratives of how we are to live our lives come into our thinking. And then we try to get mad at each other when, when let's say for example, if the man is saying, I shouldn't cook, I shouldn't have to cook. Well, you gotta look at your situation. What is your situation? Is is your woman home all day and is not doing anything else, right? So if that's the case, then, then maybe, maybe you shouldn't have to cook. Who knows? 
but there's no one way of having a relationship. We have to be adaptable as a people because every situation is coming against us. And even though there's always been this big divide between the, the lower class and the middle class black family and the upper class black families, there's been these divides. At the end of the day, listen, if one of us fall, we all fall. So anyway, that's what he was talking about with, in terms of roles. And I have to say the same thing that he saw in the 70s, it has existed before the 70s. We were egalitarian when we were in, enslaved. You know, the men and the women have to take care of the home. Yeah, we did have specific roles during that time. Yeah, I mean, not everything was as equal, but it was, it was, it was adaptable. It was adaptable. And I think that we need to get back to that right now. The fourth major strength that Dr. Hill identified was high achievement orientation. I love this because when you look at us as black folks, I don't care what category you look at us in, if we're given the right love, the right affection, the right opportunities, opportunities, not handouts. You just need to give us an opportunity. No one is asking you to do it for us. Just give us the space. Put us in the ring. I bet you we win that fight. You get what I'm saying? Put us on the track. I bet you we outrun you. Put me on the basketball court. I bet you I shoot more three pointers. Put me, put me in a doctor's um program. I bet you I ace it and become a doctor. Put me whatever, whatever. Just put us in the right space. And as a people, we murder it. Y'all know I'm not telling a lie in this area. You know, y'all know, you know, I'm not telling a lie in this area. So that's something that we have to understand right now. And then when I see my children, not just my children, when I say my children, I'm talking about all the children, your children, my children. When I say my children, I'm responsible for everybody. You're responsible for everybody. That's how I look at it. I am my sisters and my brother's keepers. And when I see my children in today's, if they are given the opportunity our children are so freaking creative. Our children are so freaking intelligent, so smart, so enduring. The only thing we need right now is opportunity. But you know what breaks my heart? Something has shifted. Something has shifted. And not in everybody's home. But I see so many parents killing their, their, their kids' dreams. And I don't understand why there's so many parents killing their children's dreams and their visions. So, oh no, that, 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 you know, you don't want to do that. Why don't you go do this? This is more safe for you. Oh, get good grades and do this. Don't explore, don't invent anything. And they don't have to verbally say it out of their freaking mouth not to invent something. I see it. I see it when I, when I, when I speak to certain dreams are deflated. They don't even know what they want to do in life. And that just kills me. It kills my spirit and it kills my heart because I know that whatever we need to achieve, we can achieve. I see it all the time, all the time. It doesn't matter whether you're rich, whether you're poor. It doesn't matter if you're upper class, lower class, given the opportunity, we murder it, murder it. And then a the fifth major strength that, that Dr. Hill came out with was, now I don't, Let me just tell you what the strength is, and then I'll tell you what my opinions are on this. Was religious orientation. So basically what he's saying is just being affiliated with religious institutions is a strength. And I get it. I understand why. And remember, this article was written in 1972. 1972. I get it. I understand why. He, Dr. Hill is saying that is a strength because you got to understand back in the days in the, the 50s and the 60s, the church was more than just the church. The church or the mosque or whatever was more than just a religious institution. Back in the days, what that actually symbolized was a place for us to make things happen as a people. We made a lot of things happen as a people. We used to have meetings, mobilize people. We clothed our people. A lot of things happened under the church during that time. So yes, it was a strength. But let me ask you guys something. And I, I, I want to know honestly, because I know that this is another area in our lives that we are torn. 
as black people in a community, another area we are torn. Do you guys feel that that going to a religious institution is a must in order for us to 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 be successful as a people? Do you feel that when when church enrollment or religious institution disenrollment, that's what I should say, occurred, that's when we lost footing? Do you believe that? What do you guys think? Because I'm going to tell you what I think. I believe, and I'm trying to watch my words carefully now, people, but I believe that in many instances, I see people going into their religious institutions and yeah, they build their little family, but the, 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 the conditions with the people in the church is not that much different than the people that are not in the church. I, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. There's still domestic violence occurring with people that go to church. There's still drug addictions and drug abuse and alcoholism occurring with people that are in the church. There's still people who are broke as hell and they go to church faithfully, broke as hell, and they're in the church. So what What really What really is the church doing right now for the people? And, and I'm not, when I say the church, I'm talking about religious institutions. I don't want y'all to get so caught up on the church, but I'm saying religious institutions. There's still children born out of wedlock that, that their parents are, are in the church. There's still affairs going on or what they call infidelity going on within the church. There's still pedophilia going on within the church. There's still corrupt, corrupt finances going on in the church. There's still people in the church that can't read a lick to save their lives. Illiteracy going on in the church. Financial illiteracy, educational illiteracy, you name it. There's still illiteracy in the church. So so if, if these things, am I lying? I mean, y'all let me know. Am I lying? Because I see it. I see it. But but I'm saying like, if, if he's saying religious orientation is a strength, and I'm not saying I disagree with that, because I do see a lot of positive things in the church as well. If he's saying is a strength, what I'm asking us, what I'm asking us is if you don't have a religious orientation, is he saying that there's a weakness in our community? Because there's some communities that they, they don't go to church. They don't go to church. Now, 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 when I look at when I look at if I'm gonna look at class, for example, let me just let me just focus on class for a second. If I'm gonna look at the, the middle class and the upper class and compare it to the lower, the lower class, let me tell you something that I see. I see more poor black people or lower class black people, I see more of them faithfully in the church than I see upper class black people. And this is just from my own experience. I don't know what y'all see where you're at, but I see it in my own experience. I see more poor people like they're, they're faith, faithful. Everything goes back to the Bible, right? You, you can't tell them nothing. So how much, how much do we really need to depend on the church in order for our community to get right. If you ask me, and I know y'all ain't asking me, but if you ask me what I think, this is just my opinion. The views that I'm about to share is views of Dr. Shauna and Dr. Shauna alone. I hold these views. But if you ask me, when it comes to putting such an emphasis on religion, I personally feel that Religion is bondage. I feel that programming the minds of some of our people as it relates to religion has harmed our community. It, 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 I feel it has been a way to control much of what's happening in our community right now today. And I feel that that's problematic. So why is it? Why is it that we have so many people? And just because, just because you, you, um, don't go to church or you don't go to a mosque, it doesn't mean that you're not a spiritual person. It doesn't mean that you're not connected with God. But why is it that I see so many successful people? And I'm not saying I don't see successful people in the church. That's not what I'm saying. But I see so many successful people. And when you ask them about their church, a lot of them are not affiliated with any religious institution whatsoever. Whatsoever. And you can't tell me for the life of me that God ain't blessed enough. God bless the sinner innocent. The sun comes rises and the sun sets 
on both center and state. Everybody get every, if you open your eyes, you blessed. So, so at this day where we are right now in 2018, and I'm not trying to be funny because I'm about to get into the solutions and I'm out of here. But in 2018, where we are right now, how is the church right now shifting our conditions? The church can galvanize people. The church can influence people in such great ways. So the question that I have for my church people, and if y'all know any pastors, tell a pastor to contact me. I would love, I would love to speak to to the pastor, yes, Ida, Jim Jones, right? The church, some churches do it, but not enough. The church has the power to galvanize the people in such ways that they can do some awesome things. The church, in my opinion, should be teaching financial literacy. The church, in my, people, in my opinion, should be tackling education even if they don't open up their own school there should be tutoring services after school there should be things going on in the church because because children i mean parents love the church so much they'll they'll force their children into it no matter what the church should be buying houses real estate and housing their own people have the people pay the rent to the church for living in their house and in development all those people that faithfully come through and pay tithes, why are we giving a, a, a donation to the building fund when we should be giving donation to the real estate fund? Not so we can build another church, so but so we can build a supermarket, so we can build a clinic, so we can build a school, so we can build housing, so we can build a recreation center, so we can build a community center. Why are we doing that collectively in the church? The church has the power to transform the black community. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, they can do some great things. They can do some great things. Why, why isn't this happening across the board? Now you see people from all different areas. We have Mississippi, Illinois, New York, Michigan, all over. We got people from, from California, all over. All these different churches. Why isn't there a national agenda from one black church to another? All the way across. And the same is true in mosques. Why, why isn't it like that? One agenda all the way across so we can know what we're doing collectively and we can know how we're moving. So I think I think that the, the church in, 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 in the, the mosque in 2018, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? You don't, you don't need to go to a house of worship to, to praise God. What's the purpose? Now, so where do we need to go? And I'm out. I feel we need to start moving toward an agenda. There's another article I was reading. I want to give you guys that guy's name too, right? I want to give you guys that guy's name so y'all can look up his article as well. I like to give y'all things that I read. Cause I don't come up with these things on my own. I, I read things and I get I get influenced by them and they're good things. So he has his name is Gary Cunningham, Dr. Gary Cunningham, or Gary L. I don't know what the L stands for. Dr. Gary L. Cunningham. He wrote an article titled "Toward an African American Agenda: Restoring the African American Community and Family or Family and Community." And in his article, what he was basically saying is we have to start moving toward a new agenda. And he said back in 2007, him and Dr. Robert, was it Robert White? Uh, um, Joseph. Him and Dr. Joseph White, they started to meet together collectively and come up with some ideas of what they can do for the African-American community. And even though he's out West, so all my people in Minnesota and stuff like that that's on here, Y'all can look up this program. If y'all know about this program, please tell me about it. I'm going to contact this person to see if I can bring him on to, to my, my, my platform and we can speak to him about what he's been doing. But they have been successful in doing it. They came up with a program and it's, um, it's called the Twin Cities African American Leadership Forum. The Twin Cities African American Leadership Forum. And he managed to bring together 42 
different African American leaders who are doing things in their community. Now let me let me go ahead and define what I mean and what he means when we say leadership. Because a lot of people, they get caught up on this idea of what a leader is. We're not saying that these people are going to lead all of the African-American people. It means that they are a leader in their own respective right. It means that they are making things happen in their own community, right? Whatever it is, no matter how big or how small, we are all leaders. So do not let people make you feel bad because you may not be popular and you may not be organized and big strikes and stuff like that. You're still a leader. If you're doing something for your community, you are a leader. That's how I am defining leadership, okay? And what he did was he brought together 42, 42 different African-American leaders. And they sat down and it was hard. He didn't, he didn't get 42 right away. It started out with five, and then it grew to 15, then it grew to 20, and then some people dropped out. Some people came back on, and eventually it grew to 42. And what they committed to do was meet on a weekly basis, and they, they would go through all their differences, but at the end of the day, even in their differences, they found things that they shared common thoughts and beliefs on. So they started to focus on their similarities as opposed to their differences. And this can be done no matter if you are Christian, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, it doesn't matter. It can be done with all of us. It doesn't matter if you're Democratic, Independent, Republican, whether you are poor, we all are experiencing things that are similar to one another, right? We're gonna have differences. And that's the thing about our community that bothers me, that pisses me off it pisses me off so much, is that we so much focus on our differences. We want to argue about the differences, whether we're Black, whether we're African American, whether we're Indigenous to America, whether we're this, whether we're Catholic, we should be Democrat, we should be Republican, oh, whether we're this, what, I mean, come on. We focus on the things that do not freaking matter. None of those things, if, if we're honest, they don't matter. Some of us are losing our freaking lives. Some of us, our children are drinking. Detroit, let me know, Detroit. I know I got Detroit on the speed. The water, is it still poisonous? Because my understanding it is. Some of us got children that can't even drink freaking water without running the risk of dying or are developing severe, severe cognitive disorders and disabilities. And we worrying about these stupid things. We got cops killing our people. And we worrying about our differences. We got failing schools. You know, what, what was that governor that was running against the, the, the lady that said she'll attend a public, a public hanging? What town was that? Was that Mississippi? I believe it was Mississippi. Somebody got to tell me this. I think it was Mississippi. But at the end of the day, Mississippi is at the bottom. The bottom for black people in advancement. At the bottom. Their children are failing in schools. Some of their children can't even freaking read. Are you serious? We want to argue about stupid stuff and we got people in 2018 that can't read? Unfreaking believable. But when it comes to what Dr. Cunningham did with Dr. White, I think what they created was awesome. Y'all got to look this up because this is still going on and they focus on the Northwest. And what they do, what this forum does, it, it, it creates intentional dialogue among the leaders so that we can get on a common agenda, a common agenda. We still got work to do, but at least they started doing this. And they started doing it in 2007. Are they where they want to be? They're not where they want to be right now. But and, and it's going to take a process for us to get to where we want to be because we have been so traumatized. We have been so damaged that we start to see one another as the enemy. We start to believe, well, the way this person is doing it, it ain't good. And then the other person is saying the same thing about the other person. But he got them on the same page. And what he did was he started to mobilize and support community-driven events to own and act on a common agenda. So this is about us developing an agenda that can help us move our people forward. And that's what we have to do. We have to be willing to start meeting in all of our areas, in all of our areas. So if you are in New York, you got to start meeting with uh, different people. Don't, over, don't only pick the people that you agree with. 
That's another thing I see with so many of us. We want to pick the people that we like. Let me tell you something. I am surrounded by people that have different thought processes than I do. They have different rhetoric, different behaviors, different beliefs than I do. But they also have beliefs and behaviors and stuff that I agree with and that I am like. So even though it might be hard for me to listen to somebody who I just, that makes me cringe, I'm able to do that because there's something that they have that I don't have. And that's a different experience. You hear what I'm saying? There's something that they have that I don't have. And that is a different experience. And I think that's where we need to start with our people. We have to be willing to accept people who are different from us. Different from us. If I was formulating this kind of forum, like Dr. Cunningham and Dr. White developed, if I was formulating this kind of forum, I'm going to have somebody who is same sex, same sex oriented. I'm going to have somebody who's transgender. I'm going to have somebody who can't read a day in their life. I'm going to have somebody who's an awesome scholar. I'm going to have a doctor. I'm going to have potentially an ex drug dealer or a current one too. I mean, they want to come. I don't know. But you get what I'm saying? I'm going to have so many different people because everybody brings to the table an experience and we can learn from everyone. I am so sick and tired of being part of groups that I drop out of because they only want to focus on their like-mindedness that is toxic and poisonous. Does that make sense? They don't want to see somebody else's opinion. They don't want to hear somebody else's view. They don't want to understand what somebody else is going through. They don't want to go through any of that because they believe in their heads that their way is the right way. And so many of us, we have had this kind of thinking for a long time, a very long time, and we wonder why we are still in the same position we are in today. We got to let that crap go in order for us to get on a common agenda. And I can't tell you right now what the agenda is. I'm doing my own research. I'm seeing what has worked in the past and what hasn't worked right in the past. Right now, I'm in the midst of a deep analysis, a deep critical study of Marcus Garvey. And I can see through all my critical analysis and my studies what worked for him and what didn't work and why it didn't work. And we have to be able to do that. We have to be able to analyze what is working and what is not working. And the things that is not working, why isn't it working? Nothing is new under the sun. And if we're not able to speak to each other, despite our differences, whether you have an education or you don't have an education, whether you have money or you don't have money, whether you're light-skinned or you're dark-skinned, whether you're short or you're tall, whether you're married or you're single, all these divisions, all these divisions among us, they're hurting us. They're hurting us as a people. So when I read this article or when I read this article about the African-American agenda and moving toward needing to have an African-American agenda, we all can agree with that. We do need to meet, move toward an African-American gender, but there's, there's a breach or there are breaches, breaches that are keeping us from doing it. There's a divide. There's a gap. There's a gap that's keeping us from doing it. We have the middle class against the lower class. We have the older people against the younger people or vice versa. We have the light skin against the dark skin. We have the educated against the, the, the non-educated or the undereducated. We have the employed the resident job employed against the professional. We got so many freaking divides that I, I, I don't know. I don't know if we can get toward an agenda because everybody want to be the head nigga in charge. Everybody want to be the HNRC. It don't work that way. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I start to get frustrated. I really do start to get frustrated. When I think about our condition where we're at, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm gonna say this and I'm out. And I don't, I don't want to bring, I don't, I don't want to bring another culture in here. But I have to, I have to, because I examine all types of cultures. That's just what I do. I see immigrants. 
coming to this country. And I'm not going to have an immigrant conversation, so just bear with me. I see immig immigrants coming to this country. I don't care if they're of African descent or other. I don't care. And I see them come through and they build. And they build. And I say to myself, why is it they can come through, come through tripping? Sorry, I just, you know, slipped, slipped into my ghetto stage, come through tripping. Dimes on my next stage tripping. Anyway, I see them come through. And they start building. And I said, what is it? What is it? Why, why, why do they build that fast? I don't care what kind of immigrant they are. They're, they move collectively. They move on a collective agenda. You see, they don't look at each other as rich or poor. It's like, how can we do this? How can, how can we all win? How can we all win? And they start moving together collectively. And I see them come in and they'll buy one abandoned house, fix it up, go into the next house, fix it up, go into the next one. That's for some cultures. Then I see other cultures, they may not buy an abandoned house. They might buy a, a, a three family house as opposed to buying a, a single family house. And then grandma lives in a house and auntie and uncles and their cousins and, 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 and somebody they know from their country that they may not be related to, but they, they bring them over and they sponsor them and they get in and they build. And then when that person gets enough money and they buy a house, they do the same thing. They do the same thing and then it, it just gets passed down. So I said, wow, they do that, but we don't want to live with each other when it comes to the descendant of slaves or the, um, the, um, the American African, right? The American of African descent. We don't want to do that. We want to have our own house and we want my house to be bigger than your house. It's crazy. It blows my mind. I was told a story two weeks ago from a black farmer. His name is Baba. And what Baba said was a lot of the black farmers and where he's at in Virginia are struggling, right? Whereas the white farmers, the white farmers, listen to what I'm saying, people. What the white farmers did is they collectively pulled their money together to buy a cotton picking machine. And the machine cost a million dollars. And all these white farmers, with the exception of one, I don't know how the African-American person got on that deal, but he got on that deal. He was smart, right? He was smart. He was like, F all this, y'all wanna argue, y'all wanna pull your money together, I'm out. But nonetheless, he got in on that deal. And they pulled together all their money collectively and they bought this cotton picking machine that cost a million dollars. Then they take this machine and they go around and they pick everybody who's in that collaborative. They pick all those people cotton, you know, wrap it up into a bale that weighs about, weighs about a ton or so. And then they sell it, right? You get $20,000 for a bale of cotton, a ton of cotton, right? You can sell it. Whereas black farmers have all these farms and they're not producing that much money on their farms. And, and a lot of farmers, not just in Virginia, but anywhere, a lot of black farmers are losing their farms. So we know collectively as a people, now you're a black farmer, I'm a black farmer, I'm starving, you're starving, the person over there is starving, we all black. We can't pull together and come up with something so that we can um, be productive and everybody can get that money. We, we can't do that. But that's what I mean when I say, if we're going to get on this having an African-American gender, if we're going to have an agenda, we got to first start getting on the same damn page. You get what I'm saying, people? We got to get on the first page. We, we got we to gotta get to a place where... It really does upset me. And it's unfortunate because I go into a lot of spaces and I'm there and I want to be there and I want to help and I want to build and I want to share ideas. I go into a lot of spaces and because, because I move differently, I may dress differently, I may drive a different car, right? I may have different privileges that other people have. I'm not always accepted as easily. I'm always looked at as suspect, as though I can't share in on experience. But people, they look at the end result. They don't understand 
where I came from. They don't understand that don't let the attire fool you. Don't let the bins fool you. Don't. Really don't. Because everybody that really knows me knows I'm Bronx born. Bronx born and raised. Like, don't let... I scare my husband sometimes. So he a pastor's child, you know? I scare my husband sometimes. Don't, don't let it fool you. But people... People judge me when I walk into the room as though I can't relate, as though I can't relate. They judge me. They see me and they think, oh, she's so far removed. Or they see my children and they think I can't relate. And I think that that's a mistake that so many of us make. Everybody has something to come to the table. Everybody who wants to build and grow has something to come to the table. So when I look at my brothers and sisters, I don't look at them in terms of, of lower class, middle class, upper class, um, educated, undereducated, a J-O-B versus a career. I don't look at them like that. I look at it like, what power do you have? Informal power, right? Informal power. What power do you have? What passion do you have? What desire you have to make a difference? And are you willing to work collectively? That's how we have to look at things. You know? I see everybody, I see everything that you guys are saying. Yes, Dean. Yes, Dean. Dean says, we want to be monolithic in all the wrong ways. And see, and that's the difference. That's the difference, Dean. And, 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 and when I engage with people, Dean, that's what I see. They say stuff like, um, no, because we got to do this. Well, who's the we? We all are not the same. We're not a monolithic people. We're not the same. How about you get out of your silo, get out of your individual thinking, Right? How about you get out of that and open up your mind to a broader perspective and, and realize that not everyone thinks like you. Not everyone's going to think like you. Why don't you be a little bit more open-minded to somebody else's thoughts? Because they might bring something valuable to the table. And I've always been that way. I remember when I was completing my doctoral program, one of the professors, she used to rip my papers apart. Like she was just, oh, she used to say to me, you know, Vishana, because my government name is Vishana. You know, Vishana, your writing is not scholarly. I said, well, I believe with your, you have to write for your audience. Maybe you're just not my audience. And she got pissed off. I mean, she got really pissed off. I said, you're not my audience. I said, I said let, me, let me say something to you. And I'm not going to say her name. I said, Dr. So-and-so. I said, let me, let, me, let me make it clear what my divine purpose is and where I'm going in life. See, you can't stop what's about to happen. So you're saying my writing is a scholarly. Writing for who? See, I'm not writing to become a professor at a university. I'm not writing to publish textbooks. Like, that's not my audience. I'm not writing to train student social workers in, a, in an academia setting on, on how to do social work or how to mobilize people or how to transform communities. I'm not writing for that audience. I'm in this program so I can do what I need to do to bring back information to my people. And I need to be able to write for my people. And I need to be able to write in a language that my people understand so that they can be able to make it applicable. I don't have to use the word like um, phenomenology in order for my work to be doctoral. I don't have to use the word epistemology in order for my work to be doctoral or scholarly. I don't have to use the word ontological. Ont 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 in order for my work to be scholarly. I don't have to speak that way. I don't have to speak in those languages in order for me to prove who I am as a scholar. I only need to read it to understand what those things mean. That's it. So I can be able to translate it. Oh, that lady didn't like me. 
that lady didn't like me. But you know what I did as a person and, and going through that, that process? What I did was, again, we have to be willing to be able to network with people who are different from us. There was one student in my class. I'm going to say this and I'm out. There was one student in my class. Oh, my gosh. She had the scholarly language down packed. I didn't understand 95% of the things that that girl was saying about a dictionary and a thesaurus. I was looking at this lady like, what the? Who? Do you even have any friends? Like, who talks like that? It's like Michael Eric Dyson. Like, who the hell talks like that besides him? You know? So, anyway. I befriended her and, and I actually like her. I actually got to know her and I and I got to like her and, and I got to be able to say to this girl, listen, that's going to work in academia. Like you need to transition and, and be able to relate to real people in the real world. Like, so you got to learn how to switch. So what I did for her and what she did for me is she helped me to be able to speak like her. So I, I was able to master that sucker. I don't like it. I don't use the language. She helped me to be able to speak like her and to write like her. And I helped her to be able to speak like me and to write like me so that we can reach larger audiences. So one of my, one of my websites is all of that language. Like if y'all go to savingblackmarriages.com, savingblackmarriages.com, it's all of that language. That's that total work. But guess what? I was able to write it in such a way that both the scholar and the lay person can get it. And that's what we gotta be willing to do in our community. We gotta be able to be bilingual. We gotta be able to be tolerant of different people. Somebody who is, for example, same sex, may not speak the same language you speak per se. You get what I'm saying? But you shouldn't shut the door on them because you don't agree with their lifestyle. No one's asking you to go into their bedroom. What I'm saying to you is they might have information that you need and you might have information that they need and we need to be able to communicate with each other. That's all I'm saying. And I'm just using things such as an example because the same is true with the other divides in our community. All right? I'm out. I ain't got nothing else to say. I thought it was a good research. I just want to share with you people so we can get our behinds on the same page and start moving collectively in our environment. So if you guys can start holding different um, meetings, even if you only got three people, if you guys can start coming together and bringing your thoughts together with the three people, it will grow if you're consistent and you start taking action. We need to get back to where we are, to where we were, and we need to start transforming the lives of the children in our community. We need to start stepping up and stepping in and filling those roles that other people are not able to fill for whatever reasons. We need to be able to do that. It's not always about borrowing money. It's not always about paying the bill. It's about building. It's about building. We need to learn how to collectively build. Until next time, I love you guys. I'll speak to you later. Have a blessed one.